We aren't in Kansas anymore, but I have two really special guests today. Welcome to the podcast, Veronica and Jason. So happy to have you here. We're so happy to be here. Thank you. For those of you who are just meeting these two powerhouses, they actually invited me to be on their summit. I think it was in February. It feels like a lifetime ago. And we just had such a big time on that on that recording. Maybe, I know I'm like totally preempting this, but maybe we could even share the link to that episode in the show notes if that would be something you guys would be open to. Sure, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, send you a, we'll send you a link afterwards. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I think that the it's nice to have kind of the perspective of both sides. You know, I was on, I was in the interviewee seat and now I have you two here. So welcome to Becoming the Channel. And so I want to start with some, questions, kind of some warm-up questions, but I think it'll be fun to start there. And then I can't wait to see okay. where this conversation Roll takes us. Okay. Roll up your sleeves. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be easy. These are easy questions. When you, when you guys were little kids, what did you tell people you wanted to be when you grew up? Hmm. Fireman and a truck driver. Did you really? Yeah. I, I didn't know that. Oh my yeah. gosh. You are putting out fires all the time. I am kind of a fireman sometimes. I, 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 I often say to clients, you know, you hire me as a fireman, but there's so much more work that we could be doing to elevate and, and magnify the joy and amazingness in your life. But you always are hiring me just to put out your fires. So I, Until, I fire. yeah, you are the fireman. And funny. Totally truck driver, how, do, uh, how, how does the truck driver come in? I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's maybe like, because we live in North Carolina for just a little oh, bit that longer. Was a flip. <laughs> that was a flip. Um, yeah, I don't know. That has to think about that. But I am now fascinated after 13 years. I know something new about him. <laughs> I, I always like the truck drivers, you know, when we're driving down the street yeah, and they for I sure. off, off the horn. I thought that was the coolest thing at like five or six. <laughs> so. Well, you know, to be in charge of the vibrational, you know, attention that a horn gets like wow that's a that's a powerhouse position actually <laughs> and when that truck is so big it's on the road big. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah for sure yeah. for so sure i get it so top that love yeah well, i just remember, <laughs> remember the mash games remember yes like oh of course i love the mash games yes so it'd be like what are your top three you know careers that you're going to go into mm-hmm. and for me it was always psychologist actress singer and um, in a way, I kind of do all of those still because it was really all about, um, I mean, all of the acting I did prior to this career prepared me as an empath mm-hmm. to have the confidence to be on camera because I was so terrified and broke through a lot of those barriers as an actress. Um, and then, poof, yeah, the last 20 years, just being in this profession, I wouldn't, it prepared me to be able to do the deep psychological emotional Mm. energetic work I do today Mm. because I had to do it on myself all those years of going for my dream and hitting up against obstacle after obstacle you know it occurs to me too that the actors and actresses in the world are channels Mm. Mm. you know I this is a fun fact I don't think I've ever shared I know I have never shared it on this show anyway I was in the vagina monologues Word. And I was, wow. yeah, wow. Okay. yeah. So. when I was, it was right after I'd finished my PhD, I came to ASU and they were hosting this event and I raised my hand and said, yeah. And I actually, even though it was, we had our scripts with us. So it was like a, I don't know what that's called, but it's the read yeah. we did the re- we're doing. Yeah. It was just like a script. We had the scripts with us, but I could feel the channeled experience of stepping into the particular characters or into the particular voices I had that firsthand experience but it occurs to me that the actors who I've worked with will say that especially the method actors will say that you know it's really the and and some of those actors who've done some of the dark darker roles they really have challenges of coming out of that Mm -hmm. it it hasn't been pleasant for some for sure it's definitely channel because certain characters would come through where I they're just weren't part of me and it's just Mm -hmm. that they were coming from somewhere Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) there is a Polish there's a Polish girl in me (laughs) I don't know where the accent came from the whole thing yeah so yeah it's fascinating yeah that is that's such a it's and then to make the transition into being a spiritual leader and 
doing yeah. the work that you all are doing now. Can has... I tell you something crazy though? You know, yeah. it's, this is the interesting thing about purpose. My last, one of my last nights on stage as an actor, what ended up happening was I was looking out at the audience and I had this sudden, the, the director wanted me to look out and break the fourth wall, which means I'm now looking at the audience in the eyes. And I was giving this monologue over and over again, 20 nights in a row, 20 uh, theater performances in a row. And I suddenly was done with acting. I'm on stage going, I can't say this monologue. I was, I met eyes with this older man, this older woman. And I suddenly had this intrigue, like what's, what is your story? Like, what is your life? Tell me, like I could feel their wisdom. And I was curious about suddenly all the people in the audience, I wanted to stop and say, let's just, you know, let's chat, you know? The director would have killed me. I didn't do that, but I knew it was the last time I'd be on stage. And I knew that I would be on stage in a different way where I was facilitating transformation and hearing from the audience rather than it being about some pre-scripted story which is very valuable theater, but um, so that was a massive shift. So when we, when we go for what we really, really want, I feel like our deeper purpose will continue to flower when we follow that excitement about what lights us up in the moment. It really takes us on a beautiful journey into our deep calling. It really does. I actually had chills when you said that, when you broke the fourth wall and then had that moment of clarity about, you know what, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you, as you touch on that, it just makes me uh, think of when often when people speak about, you know, I don't, I, I'm afraid that I'm going to go down the wrong path or, mm -hmm. and there's this idea that they're going to waste time or they're going to waste energy or waste money. And, and the, the beauty about going for whatever's calling in your heart at the moment is it's leading to something that we don't know. And we, we think it has to lead to that thing that we're going for. And yet, like for Veronica and myself as well, I, I explored acting in, in my mid-20s. And it, that wasn't it for me, but it, it was a stepping stone to really open my vessel and experience emotion. Like I came just like... Um, just like you spent time in Kansas and, 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 and not, it's not Kansas, but growing up in the Midwest with, with a father from that traditional way, like real men don't cry and mm -hmm. you've got to put on the strong look and the strong, you got to be strong as a man. And so that acting was a, a stepping stone for me to actually really tap into all of this emotion that was suppressed inside of me, which if I didn't have access to it, at that point, I would have had to go through a lot more as those doors were beginning to open, but that was an opening for me to keep going. So for people out there who are afraid to think that they're going to waste their time, it's actually leading to something phenomenal. We just don't know where that end point is. Yeah. And we never know. Like we don't, this isn't we our end point. Right. Yet. right. And that's the joy and the beauty, but we do know our right next step always. We know because mm -hmm. the excitement's there, the inspiration, the aliveness is very active. Even the fear especially the fear. I always say self-doubt is a green light. To go. It's not, it's not a red light saying stop. It's a green light saying go because it's just showing you that the, e the ego is freaking out. And it's really the soul. If there's a, unless a Mack truck is coming at you and you're, you know, that's a good form of fear to just not cross the street. But if it's like, I want this thing, I really want this thing, but I don't know, can I do it? Self-doubt is usually an indicator uh, to just go for it. You're touching upon a comfort line that you're about to surpass. And of course, the ego is going to throw doubt in the way to kind of pull back and remain comfortable and familiar. Um, Ride that way rather than resist it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Self-doubt, green light, go. <laughs> and I find myself wanting to say, and Jason's not driving the Mack truck. That's No, he's driving. not driving. He's not driving. <laughs> or if he is, he's honking <laughs> to make sure. He's I'm definitely the pulling the horn for sure. <laughs> Get, a, get out the way. <laughs> Here it comes. Well, there is that level of discernment, though, isn't there, between the knowing that you're holding yourself out of something because it's the right thing to do yeah. versus because I'm frozen, locked in, mm. you know, looking at the, the, potential cost of making a decision that might rock the boat or might wake, make waves or might make somebody feel uncomfortable or get mad at me. Yeah. And especially for empaths, I think that we 
collectively have this sense of like what everyone else needs, wants, desires, not just for us, but for themselves. And sometimes, I don't know if you all have experienced this, but I know that when I've made big decisions in my life, whether it was to leave my college sweetheart, get divorced and go back and start my my PhD at Kansas or any of those things, I think I was picking up, up on a lot of the emotions from my family who were like, what is she even doing? And it's scaring us because yeah. it's so out of character. Or it's so out of the way she's always done things. What, yes. What's your take on that? Like the differentiation between, is it self-doubt or is it, am I picking up on other people's doubt or fear? Yeah. I mean, I love that you're bringing this forward because you're, that's such a strong, that's such a pristine level of discernment that's required to really be able to tell what's yours and what somebody else's, but also what is, like you said, the right decision, like when in terms of one's values, like if I value honesty, but I have this excitement to go do something that could hurt someone I love, or obviously I'm going to choose that loyalty or that honesty. Like there's a fine line between what is that excitement that's actually profitable for all concerns and healthy and vibrationally aligned? And what are those exciting actions that are actually destructive and not in alignment with the soul at all? Um, and I think it's so important, well, to answer your question that you just asked, I put up such thick boundaries once I started to wake up and once I started to study spiritual psychology in my 20s, I, I literally just went, kind of put a wall around me between me and my nuclear family and those I love because I needed to discern who I was outside of their mental construction and, and their group think. And I needed to do that. So I wasn't actually influenced very much by them. And they were very respectful of those boundaries. So I was fortunate in that way. Um, but I can see how if, if someone's living with their family, you know, if they're geographically very close, or they're constantly talking to people who have a very different perspective, especially close family ties, it can be hard, it can be challenging to discern. But you also have the you know, the, the boundaries of what, whoever raised us and wherever, whatever our social norms were, all of those boundaries that were broken as far as kind of impregnating us with these ideas and these doubts of you, you need to be a good, mm. like I, I just sat with clients and, and Veronica had this experience as well as I just sat with clients and I asked one client, um, you know, what, what, what would they say about you? Uh, if, if at your eulogy mm. and she, she said, they'd say that I was a good girl Oof. and, you know, this is an adult woman, like in, and in a, um, and, and, and really has everything on the outside, like has the money, has the homes, has, and she's not coming from an attitude, but there's, she was raised in this traditional Italian family that you follow the rules and you be a good girl. And she was very proud of being a good girl. And, and that being good is instilled in there as a, and, and same with her brother, because I work with both of them and they're both very good boys and girls as adults, but they're, they're being, it's, they're living from, they haven't broken that boundary completely with their family that have been, that taught them being good is what's most important. And it's really not being good based on being a saint. It's being good, meaning mind what mom and dad say, mm -hmm. what mom and dad believe. And if we don't break those boundaries and those barriers in our lives, we're, we're stuck with that eternally. And we're, we're really living somebody else's life and not ours. Yeah. yeah you continue to propagate the, the patterns, the programs, the fears, the trauma from the generations that came before, unless and until you reach that point where you're like, you break the fourth wall. Yes, exactly. Ooh, I love that. Using that as a metaphor in that way too. You know, a few years ago, I, I received a gift of a health diagnosis that came in the midst of extreme burnout because I was really, I was succeed, succeeding, doing really, really well in my business and it kind of became addictive and I was going for that next thing and that next goal instead of really seeping in and enjoying my life now. 
And long story short, in the midst of that, I consulted one of my, many of my allies and mentors, but one of them I reached out to immediately and I was collapsed. I was like, I can't hold this life, this business anymore. I'm exhausted, da, 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 da. And the words that came out of my mouth were, I'm so tired of being good. I'm so tired of being good. And it surprised me one day on the floor crying, going through this really big transformation. Those floor moments are like always springboards to, to that next level. It doesn't always feel like that at the time, but he, Steve Seiler, he looked at me and he said, Veronica, you are not here to be good. Mm. You're here to be real. That is the meaning of your life. And it took me some time to really process that because my brain was like, no, 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 I, I am here to be good. <laughs> like, I'm here to be a good girl. He's like, you are innately good. Like, there's, that's not changeable. That is your cellular makeup. You were born good. You are generous. You are kind. You are caring. You are thoughtful. That's innate. But you didn't come here for that. You came here to be yourself. And anything other than being yourself is an attack on yourself. And that's going to, uh, that's going to be a problem with your health. It's going to create problems with health. It's like self versus self. It was such a beautiful epiphany. And that's, yeah. and, and it, you, we, we touched on empaths and that's what our last summit was about that we spoke of at the yeah. beginning is, you know, when you're, when you're already sensitive, you're sensitive, you're empathic, you're already sensitive to the people around you, you think of the people around you, you you're, the, you're the first person to say, I hope I didn't upset anybody, I hope I didn't say something that was, yeah. and the reality, you know, you say that sometimes, yeah. and, and I'm like, sweetheart, the reality is, you're the last one who's going to upset anybody yeah. besides me. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to, you're, you, you speak, even when you're standing strong and clear, you still do it in a loving way, in a gentle way that it's yeah. not going to, it's going to upset almost nobody. Well, now right? I'm happy to piss people off, to be honest with you. I, honestly, if I, if I'm being true to what is inside of my soul to share and to express, it's going to ruffle feathers. And it does people get agitated or annoyed and that's okay because the people who need to hear that message, for example, even saying what I just said, some people might argue, no, that's, you are here to be good. Like, and then they may start arguing that and that's okay. That's their perspective. And I can give them the right to believe that. And I know what is health and what is truth for me now. Um, so it's, I'm able to share many things that may ruffle feathers. It took a health diagnosis though, because for many of us empaths, but even that, you're going to also, you're going to share it in a loving manner. And yes, it's yes. much easier to be received. It's more than someone who's yeah. really, who's really sharp and not, it's not about strength, but just the, the edge that some of, or don't care. Right. Like you come across and you may st share a strong stance and you care. It comes from love. Right. Yeah. As, soon, mm -hmm. as long as the origin is love, the intention is pure. I'm happy to say anything, <laughs> but if my intention is off in any way, that's not going to come out of my mouth. I get to check myself. Yeah. 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 If you're constantly censoring yourself to not piss anybody off versus yeah. I, I almost feel like that that's an act of self-betrayal. You can yes. say things, you can say things and be be honest you don't have to be brutal in your honesty mm -hmm. and I think that that's the especially for people who are highly empathic there's this new term I found recently it's called hyper empathic huh. it's like I'm I'm giving it like if we look at my the neo personality profile that I've I've talked about my listeners know it well because I talk about it all the time but um I would say it's probably the top five percentile of mm. people who really have this clairsentience, the, the hyper empathic physical experience of other people's emotions. So we can not just know that somebody's having a direct response to something that we've said, we can actually feel it in our bodies. Feel we it. can feel the psychic attack. So yes. if you're constantly having to guard against that yes. by couching your words and playing a ch an internal chess match to see how can I say this thing so that I don't yeah ruffle feathers or piss somebody off that first of all it takes up a lot of energy and secondly it's really a, an act of self-betrayal in from my where i'm sitting what do you guys think about that absolutely it's it's uh it's it's a 
it's a self betrayal that is seems like it's giving a short it gives a short term payoff because we're avoiding the conflict we're we're, we're feeling like we're safe but in in the bigger perspective there's more and more resentment there's more and more um like a a disowning of self yeah. it's almost like there's we're we're courting two different selves yeah. there's this time where we're if we do have an inner practice or we do we are going inside then we there's an opportunity to reconnect to the true self but every time we're doing that it's almost we're splitting ourselves and it's that we're putting a face on for the outside and then maybe maybe somebody close to you is the only one who actually sees the whole picture yeah it's a short term payoff for a long term cost and the real like i think what's important to share with listeners is what do you do about that when there's a genuine feeling of panic or trauma is getting activated and the people pleasing is kicking in or the perfectionism or the performance or whatever those masks are that have worked those control patterns that the ego uses to stay safe what do you do and what i've really discovered and come to is the only way to break those patterns is actually to become your own safety to become so good at and so consistent with every night going to bed holding oneself really first of all letting the body know which is physically going to respond to physical touch um, you know letting the inner child know however one works with these energies i'm here with you i'm not leaving and to become the mother that we needed even if we had a fantastic mother how can you be the mother or the father of yourself and your body and your emotions and let those feelings come up so that we no longer seek that outer approval because that place inside, it's not us who are insecure, our, our, our whole powerful selves in the present. It's the little one who learned that they were not the authority and they were dependent on you know, authorities to survive. And so it's really going back in time and mothering that part of ourselves into safety over and over and over again. It is such a rich life when one knows that they have their own back, like anything's possible because everyone can turn against you. And yet it's like, was my intention pure? Yes. Did I do my best? Yes. And do I have my own back? Am I holding myself through this? Yes. And, and, really, and th these, are, these are such beautiful ways to actually bring us back into the present moment mm -hmm. and bring us back into the here. Am I here right now? Yeah. And touching on that safety, it's that, that question that really works for me when I'm in those places of the stress is up or the anxious is, not, is up or there is feeling like a lack of safety, a threat that's out there is, am I okay right now? Am I like right now? There's is there a tiger chasing me right now? Is really what we're asking is is there a tiger chasing you right now? Is yep, yeah, no, but the I have an eviction notice on my door. Okay, that that can be really scary and it can be very traumatizing and unsettling. And right now, are you safe? Right now, are you okay? And if we can bring it back to the moment now, 99.9% .9 of the time we're okay right now. It's, yeah. There's a future moment or a past moment that's occurring that has created this feeling that, that we're not okay, but it's actually not right now. And if it is right now, then take the action you need to, to actually become okay, become yes. safe in this moment. Yes. And that's, that's the only time. And then preparation, you know, some of the things that are so great is finding that technique or that tool that helps you return here. So if we're always in the future or the past, then um, then are we carrying that into our sleep? So writing, taking a log, writing in a journal before you go to sleep. So for me, it's like a list of things to do. So I, if, if I often in, at times in my meditations over the years, I notice that my first 10, 15 minutes is just going through all of the laundry list of the things to do and just repeating it three, four or five times. Okay, I finally figured out, just write down the gosh darn things that you've got to do, Jason. So then the mind doesn't have to keep repeating that. And then I can come here. And then coming here, we realize everything's available and, and really everything is okay. Yes. So much of what you're talking about is self-soothing. Mm. 
self-soothing the nervous system, self-soothing the inner child. And I loved what you said about being there for yourself, having your own back. It's that self-loyalty, which for empaths often gets distorted into being selfish. Mm. So we've been talking a lot about discernment today. I think that that's one of our major kind of themes that we're, we're hitting on. Yeah. When you talk with people about, well, that, that discernment between, am I being self-loyal or am I being selfish? Mm -hmm. What's the, what's the conversation or what's the perspective on that? That I'm going to touch on this. Yeah. I call it selfless selfishness. So Mm -hmm. we're told that we're, we're selfish if we don't think about the other person first and we don't do it for the other person. And yet, if we don't do it for, for ourselves first, meaning if we're not checking in to make sure that it's in alignment for us, that we're that after we do that deed or that action or that helping of other, that we're not resenting it or that we're not enervated from that situation. If we are, then we've actually done, done a disservice to ourselves. And we've done a disservice to that other person because then we're, we don't want to answer their call next time. We're all holding resentment. And usually when we're holding resentment, we're projecting it onto that person. It's very hard not to. So selfless selfishness is this place where from the outside, we may be fearing that the people believe we're selfish, but really what we're doing is we're giving to ourselves so we can give to others. So we can... I, we also speak of it from giving from the overflow, not from the undertow. Mm-hmm. If you're giving from the overflow, you always have enough and you're, you're honoring your, you must honor yourself in order to honor others. If you're dishonoring yourself, you're dishonoring everyone around you because we're all one and we're all in an energy field together. So, yes. so that, so that place of giving from the overflow is this abundance there's always enough and if i'm if i'm giving from the undertow i don't have it which means i'm giving and i'm making myself sick i'm making myself worse off which then means i'm going to either resent you or then i'm going to need you to give and expect you to give from that same place and it creates a vicious cycle mm-hmm. and that is why i hate the book the giving tree <laughs> 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 every even your stuff you're going to give away oh my god I just can't even I just can't even with that book um <laughs> it it propagates that belief that it's better to give than to receive which is that is generational genetic it's cultural mm-hmm. societal it's there's religious undertones to that as well and what you all are saying is and to no great surprise we're aligned on this is that there's that sacred reciprocity that yeah, it has to, beautiful. it has to be of service to me as well. This conversation has to be of service to me. If it's not, then yeah. what are we doing here? And you, you can feel that yeah. when it's, when there's a push pull in the energy, yeah. I want to go to burnout because I think, especially for entrepreneurs and business owners who are empathic, I think a lot of the burnout stems from that old belief system. that's better to give than to receive. For sure. Yes. Yeah. That's a, it's a huge one. And it's, if we look at the root of why is it so important for me to give, I mean, it's actually important to like, look at the root of that. And, um, I was just at, we're in Portugal right now. We've been traveling for a few months and I went to this incredible healer and she was working, you know, doing this profound work. She's medically focused and also very intuitive and connected to energy and, And she said, I want you to just pay attention to the thoughts you have during the massage. I want you to just notice the thoughts. And as I'm receiving, right, just notice the thoughts that come up. The thing that was fascinating, there were five or six thoughts that were really like taking me away. (laughs) Um, And I looked at them and realized they were the exact same thoughts. They were all thoughts of how can I serve somebody else? So I was like, this is the best massage of my life. I have to get one for Jason. This, oh my God, this woman is so talented. How does she not have a bigger business? I have to help her with her business. Oh my God, that person's email. Like I just thought of an idea for her. I'm going to do this and da, da, da. everything was like, how can I help someone? And fortunately I've done this enough times where I can come back to my breath and I can like go, ah, fascinating. Wow. And just come back to the moment. 
but it was it was really interesting to go why is that why does my ego use that strategy to pull me out of receptivity to pull me out of receiving to pull me out of overflow and really it comes down to if i give i am safe i am i had to many of us learned especially as empaths god you're so loving your energy is so amazing we'd see people literally we could dismantle bombs with a smile with a touch on the shoulder we could see people raging and angry i don't know about you as a kid i was called the angel in the family you know some of us may have certain different archetypes but many empaths uh, learn i am valuable because i help people that's my purpose that's who i am and they will forego because the, it feels so thrilling to receive that kind of accolades, that kind of feedback. It's like, I'm valuable, I'm worth something. But if I don't give, I'm worth less. And that's where there's a problem. And it's such a beautiful thing as well, Robin, to, you know, are, are, you, are we comfortable receiving a compliment? Like, mm -hmm. really, are we really willing to own it? You know, are we really... And if, if somebody offers um, to buy, buy you a coffee, do you have to immediately give it back? You know, it's like we just get it. There's eternal opportunities. Just, just check where where is it in balance? Like the shamans who I work with in Peru is always speaking about Aini. It's a giving and a receiving. It's a reciprocation. That's how the wheel of life goes. It's the rain comes down and then the earth gives it back through through the energy of how water and, and how uh, humidity works to bring it back to the clouds and then the clouds bring it down. And that's the natural process. But if we're getting in the, in the, in the way of that because of our wounds and our belief systems and our whether it's an inferiority complex or whatever it is, it's like, how do we get those pieces out of the way so it's just authentic and true and real yeah. from out from without the place of manipulation or trying to prove or get or give the burnout to get back to the burnout it came for me because it did become a bit of an addiction to see the impact the work we've been doing and I have been doing was having on people people with radical very low self-confidence a lot of self-doubt popping getting visible sharing their gifts coming out of hiding feeling amazing you know, just on purpose, lit up, awake, you know, it, it's, it is addictive mm -hmm. to impact someone like that. And it's beautiful, but there, fortunately, many of the healers I was working with, they kept saying the middle way, Veronica, pick balance, the middle way, the middle way, the middle way. So I had to swing from that direction to just take only working with the people who had already paid me and then for like two years, I was just taking such, like working with five people to fill my cup until I found my way to enjoy my life now as I serve. Hence, lots of swimming in Portugal, <laughs> lots of sunshine. <laughs> Beach time, yes. play time, good food. Oh, you know, I love that you're in Portugal and I can't believe how many Americans I know who are headed to Portugal right now. Yeah. It's really pretty interesting to see. The, Portuguese are saying that like, the Americans are coming here now and that it hasn't been that way until now. Yeah. It yeah. could be a yeah. whole podcast, honestly, yeah. of why, because I didn't know I, this wasn't even on my radar. It's the, it's the sixth most peaceful country in the world. To give oh. you context, the United States is 138. Uh, no one yeah you're right Afghanistan one, is 160 Afghanistan is last yeah. and it's like around 160 and the U.S. is like, like 138 130. um and it's six here and the people there's no superstar syndrome here nobody cares about success or what you look like what you wear they're not in your business so they're not simple to do the prom so there's no prom every day no no and everyone <laughs> sort of like there's just there I say this in the most generous way or biggest compliment nobody stands out here like from each other yeah. it's like everyone just shines mm -hmm. they're just at so peace good. they're walking slowly they're enjoying the light they're smiling they're laughing together they love their lives and they don't need this big man that magnanimous house or life in order to be happy they're they're satisfied with yeah. themselves I'm just yeah. gobbling. I'm like, I'm going to eat their food. I'm going to drink the, the air. I'm going to like swim yeah. the water and see what happens. Wow. See what happens next. Yeah, I, I feel that vibe over here. Portuguese elixir. 
All right. I am I'm I was just tuning in because I want to shift gears just a little bit. I just I was sharing before we started recording that I'm contributing to an article for the Daily Ohm on finding your your soulmate. Mm. But I really want to talk with you two about divine life partnerships, soulmate relationships. How do you feel about Watch that? Out. <laughs> uh, well, you, you know, we, we both laugh about this is like it, we wish you a lot of luck if you actually find your soulmate and soul partner oh, because yeah. they're going to bring all of your stuff up. Whatever mm -hmm. you haven't processed, whatever you haven't looked at, your soulmate <laughs> is going to bring it up to the surface. So we always you, say good luck. Like good. when someone in our community is like, I found this partner, like totally equal partner, like a mate. We're like, Ooh. good luck, honey. Good luck. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and you. It, <laughs> it's it's such a blessing and it's also ex any any true partnership is not easy it's mm. it's but life is not easy and if you're in a true journey and relationship with yourself it's not easy yeah, it's going to call you to the plate and if you're really doing the work and you're actually mm. really showing up with each other which is really what's required to be in a divine partnership yeah. because you've got to communicate through things you've got to You've got to share and be willing to take risks and even risk the relationship to have it all in the relationship. The only way to have it all in the relationship be is being willing really to let it go. It. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and we've been willing to lose it many times to gain ourselves, to get ourselves. And then we actually get so much more fruit from the relationship. Yeah. Then the yeah. relationship springboards and there's definitely grace involved. Like I've said, there were a couple breaks in there over the That's last 13 really years where it's like miraculous that it worked out and that we didn't part. Um, but it, there was grace involved where, yeah. That we're, and I would say even the, the grace is something that is a great thing to touch on. And Truly, if you're going to have, from my perspective and experience in this, if you're going to have a, the, the relationships you see that you really admire, that are the real deal, that are the, the real amazing, like you're like, wow, if, if I could just even have, you know, a, a sliver of that in my relationship to build on, um, I almost assure you they've been so close to the break more yes. than once. And what, because that's how many times have we in our lives in our own journey been so close to the break of like the brink of like, I'm just ready to throw in the towel. I'm, yeah. I'm exhausted on this path. I, I just don't know if I can do it anymore. And that comes up in relationship mm -hmm. and it must, because it's real. The reality is at times in, in, in my own sacred journey, I've felt like at times I'm like, I don't know if I could do another day. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. And in the relationship as well, we've both been at the, no idea how I'm going to get how through. Yeah. <laughs> and yet those are the times that actually open. It's kind of like the, the lotus, the springing, that beauty springing from the mud and the muck is, is that lotus of the, the relationship that opens up is if you actually are willing to go through that edge, willing to go through that uh, resistance, the the rage, the the anger, even the hatred inside that's there, and and really, what's that word that um, the mystics use to turn lead into gold? Alchemy. Is, uh, alchemy. To alchemize, yeah. right? To alchemize this into gold. Yeah. And it's. It just it keeps opening the door to more. And it just takes that tiny speck of gold to turn lead into gold, right? I, I mean, I'm not a scientist or an alchemist. Well, maybe an you alchemist. are an alchemist. Let's yeah, be honest. Yeah, thank you. Like... <laughs> <laughs> but what I, I really feel what Jason's touching on is our relationship to other is in direct correlation to our relationship with self. So for example, that little kid inside or that wounded one or the pain inside really embracing that. Cause I feel a lot of people come into partnership prior to signing vows and getting married and they show up with like, I'm amazing. And oh my God. And they're just, you know, showing a certain face, the thing is signed and suddenly it's like, rah, they show maybe other facets of themselves that the other is like, Oh my God. Wow. Okay. What do I do with this? So the real key is in the relationship where we end up 
seeing everything. Mm -hmm. And so how do you hold the part of yourself that's ashamed of existing? How do you hold the part of yourself that everyone told you as a kid, don't let anyone see that, that no one will love that about you and your partner seeing it. And if they are gonna, if they could leave, may leave in, because of that, can you love yourself and not make them leaving mean something's wrong with you? This is what I'm touching on here is, sounds kind of simple, but it's deep and it's, it can feel very, very raw. And it's incredibly healing to you utilize partnership to come into wholeness. And, yeah. and so being having being in partnership with a soulmate, if we're if we're using that phrase or a twin flame, mm -hmm. um, there's no failure in it not working out, yes. so to speak. It's it's not the mm -hmm. I, I look at look upon many of my relationships from the past and 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 there's so much gratitude. For almost all of them. You were in other relationships <laughs> before me. <laughs> uh, well, the one, you know, back when I was 12. Uh, but that relationship at 12. Um, no, but that, 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 uh, there were so many gifts that were to be gleaned from each one of those relationships and from the breakups. And can you put, can you bring, really what we're doing in relationship is just a reflection of who we are in ourselves. Mm -hmm. So can you bring the love even when you don't feel it? Can mm -hmm. you, can you share? You're so good at that. Just like you're you. so, you really are. I learn a lot from this man. I have to say, sometimes I'm like, I just don't feel it and I'm not going to show it. <laughs> you know? Right. And, and all of those are like little mini lessons. Okay. Yes. So in that moment, can, can like, Last night, Veronica was just annoyed. I'm in the bedroom before she was complete with her day. With you my know? meditation. And because yeah. where are we at? We have two bedrooms in this house, but um, I have a room for mine and she has the upstairs and then we have one together, but that's where a meditation spot is. So she's annoyed as heck coming into the room because she didn't get her time to be alone and be still before she went to bed. And I'm already there. And she's, she's, you don't mind if I'm sure. No, it's, it's so human. she's just annoyed. It's like, oh my God, like you're breathing too loud. You're breathing. And I you, hear you breathing. <laughs> you shouldn't breathe. <laughs> and as the meditation <laughs> teacher, Jason, did you say, did you say, just let it be part of your meditation, sweetheart? Yeah. Well, actually, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I that mean. would not have played well. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you know, that's the funny thing is there's an opportunity. I could have either done that, right. which at times or I do. Or just stop breathing. Or stop breathing, <laughs> or or what I yeah. But it's funny because I I totally got where she was coming from. You know, like she was coming from doing more work lot, later than yeah. what she need, wanted to do, yeah. and then she comes in there and she doesn't have her moment. And I didn't put all that together, but I knew she was having a moment. Yeah. So for me, I can either turn it into my moment and then turn it into this, which sometimes. I uh, honestly, I get entangled in that. Rarely. And, I, I mean, this guy is like a Buddha, like honestly, and it's wild. So, but for that, in that moment, I, when you're, when you meditate and you have a practice, there's space between, you have a moment to choose. Yeah. And I had a moment to choose. I can either rebut and make a comment, or I can actually turn that comment back to me. Mm. And so what I, attempt to do and intend to do is turn that comment back to me and say can you use this as part of your practice right now and so and not even practice can i use this as being part of who you are and your who you truly are yeah. so in that moment i chose she can have her moment and i don't need to have to get <laughs> engaged in it. and i used it for myself and it, it took me to even a deeper level in my lying down meditation in bed that turned into being phenomenal yeah Jim. And that was actually a surrender in that moment. I, that's so powerful. And I know that's landing for people. And I'm, do you have highly sensitives in your audience? Yes. All of okay. us are highly sensitive, okay. intuitive, empathic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just some transparency here. I, for, I'm highly, probably in the hypersensitive category. I She's would, the 1% of the yeah. 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 If we were to give you the Neo, I, you would, you'd be like, <laughs> nobody is more empathic than you are on the planet <laughs> right up there, yeah. it's like um what I've come to realize is for much of my life I have admired men my father was a super dad my teachers are men typically um 
you know, there's balance, very, very loving, composed. I've had great men in my life, great models. And so, and the feminine was always not such a great model, kind of imbalanced, uh, unpredictable, maybe even dangerous. And so what I've had to come to is for much of my life, I was trying to be like Jason or my teachers or my father. And it's interesting, the, the massage therapist a few days ago, she said, sweetheart, you gotta understand something. And she's very medically focused. She's like, you are a highly sensitive. Your body is, you have so many more receptors than other people have. That's never going to change. If you try to adapt yourself to fit into how others are doing it, you're actually going against yourself. Meanwhile, she didn't know about my health diagnosis a few years ago, which I've subsequently healed. However, that I think had a large part to do with why that transpired is trying to fit into this like man's world, trying to push the way others push, not honoring this system, this highly sensitive body in the way that she needs to be honored and noticing the thoughts that say, oh, Veronica, you're, you know, one day you'll heal the highly sensitive thing. Instead of going, I'm highly sensitive and I get to create a life that honors that mm -hmm. and find a way to honor others who are not mm -hmm. highly sensitive and respect their way. Yeah, and communicate it. And yes. like, that's the that's the challenge because when you're highly sensitive, you you just you want it to stop right now. Mm. That you know when something's really you know it's it's like it's like the honking horn in your ear. Mm -hmm. Like you you don't have time to be nice about it. You want the effing guy to stop, right? <laughs> you need this horn to stop. Yeah. So let's yeah, little five year old Jason, stop honking that horn. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So quit pulling that <laughs> thing. Right. <laughs> And, yeah. and that's, and, and so for, for, so <laughs> for me, you know, I have that moment of space and, and my senses are quite dull compared to Veronica. They're not dull, but they're quite dull in comparison. So when I'm, when she's going through that, I'm like, love, why can't you just say it nicely? But what she needs is she goes, I need that to stop now. So yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm letting you know, I'm already way overloaded. It's oversaturation. There's yeah. like an oversaturation yeah. point, yeah. too much stimulation. It's a, and there's a breaking point where it's like, okay, there needs to be just like a, a stopping and a decompressing. I mean, that's actually, I, you're, you're actually inspiring some, a, a way that I, I see that I could support a whole group of people probably mm -hmm. in the world is the people who are in relationship with highly sensitive and have no idea how to Ooh. deal with it because oh boy that could be a good. whole thing i mean because most... you know there's that fine line isn't there between take taking care of yeah. and just allowing the experience mm -hmm. and giving them permission to be themselves yeah. without trying to change them i was always the crier were you a crier veronica would oh, you yes. you're a kid? i love crying i still love crying i would cry <laughs> like i remember in a seventh grade basketball game we won but it was a super intense game and after we won everyone else is celebrating and I'm standing in the center court sobbing yeah. and everyone's like what's wrong with Robin why is she crying like it's such an <laughs> exciting moment but I had taken on the whole intensity it was like that I was the channel for all of that mm -hmm. intensity and all of that focus and I was like the the epicenter of that I didn't you know when you're 12 you don't know that and in that moment I became the crier Robin always cries Oh. so there's yeah. that and then to make yourself wrong for that to make for other people to say you know stop wearing your heart on your sleeve mm -hmm. it's going to get bumped those kinds of things create oh, here this here we go again here we go again yeah. with sensitive the waterworks Susie, I would yeah. hear that here comes sensitive Susie <laughs> oh my gosh you guys we we are going to continue this conversation I just love <laughs> I love this so much and um so let's as we're kind of closing for today what are the things that are coming up that are on your heart that are that are coming for your business what's mm. going on next mm. we 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 actually every year we train uh, people to become transformational life coaches and, and that's coming up and and but what we want to talk and so we support people and actually living first living their full life themselves like yes. really owning themselves learning how to coach themselves how to how to come into self mastery themselves and then and then if they want to move to a place of actually supporting others from that 
they're doing it from living it, right? From that place of embodiment. And that's our Diamond Process Coach training program. But I bring that up to really focus on the self-mastery mystical school. What, what we have coming up in the fall is, is something really phenomenal. Yes. Both Veronica and I come from different avenues. She has, we both have that deep meditative practice and, and lifestyle. And she comes from an angle of spiritual psychology. And I come from an angle of uh, shamanism, Peruvian shamanism. And we bring this course together to support an individual to face those beliefs and those structures that are limiting them in their lives, those belief blocks, those fear blocks, and, and give them guidance in ways to address it physically, emotionally, energetically, spiritually, how to transform that into moving from them being their greatest obstacles and blocks into their greatest gifts and transformations. To creating anything, really, yeah. And in the program, they do create something tangible, which is exciting. Yeah. I love that. And I, I agree. It's so important to be healed enough mm-hmm. and to, to master yourself, to become psychologically and spiritually mature yeah. so that when you're working with people, you're not automatically just projecting your own wounded does or your own traumas onto them, but instead you, you, you have enough objectivity and maturity to be able to see what's actually going on and be yes. of the highest good and service to those that you're serving yes. so that's so yeah, good. I mean, and when you are able to do that what anything's up? possible we often say self-mastery is the foundation of masterful coaching yes. it really is self-masterful is the foundation of a masterful life it's yeah. everything yeah yes yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm excited to learn more about that. And um, we'll share those links in the show notes as well. And it's just has been a delight to have you here with us. We'll oh share God. your social media and everyone keep in touch with them. And let's keep in touch because I want to have this conversation be ongoing with the oh, three of us. So You're much so love. special. I'm great. Grateful for you, Robin. And Thank your audience. you. Yes. And I will see everybody next time.